then over there, clatter, clatter, clatter. Because you've got 350 people in the room. Anyway, <clears throat> it's not funny. <sighs> Invigilating exams is like, anyway, how can I spell it? Radio, N, stop distracting me. Um, the polytropic index, think of it as a, a property of the compressor that somewhat represents the efficiency of the compressor you're using. For problems that you're given, calculation problems you're given in class, you'll be given it. You'll be told, for a polytropic expansion process, let's, why use compressors? For a polytropic uh, expansion process where n equals 1.3, calculate the work done by the system as it expands. Okay? For a compressor of polytropic index n equals 1.1, do this. Um, so you'll be given it. For lab two, you'll calculate it. You'll be given a compressor and be told, calculate n for this compressor. Right? And so you'll kind of get a sense for, oh, okay, that's what n means. And it has different uh, polytropic indexes at different operating conditions. So different RPM and at different uh, pressure outputs, the polytropic index changes. So it's, you know, it's one of those real world things. K is really nice because it's, uh, it's something that's universal. You can read it from a table, you can use it all the time. Um, but n is what we see happen in the real world. So that was my, my little bit more. Let's not get bogged down on it. We'll understand a lot more of it after lab two, which I think you guys do in week six and week seven. Excellent. Let's do some math. So this is work. This is boundary work related calculations. A cylinder of cross section area. Area expands by distance D with the internal pressure of P how much work is done by the system on the surroundings. And I want to take this to two, two different approaches on this because I want you to see that um, you could do this more traditionally using um, potential energy, but I want to do it using pressure so you can see they're equivalent. I hope they should be. All right. So we have said that work from 1 to 2 equals its ISO Barrack, the pressure doesn't change, which is nice. So it's pressure, volume two minus volume one. We don't know what the volume, what the initial volume was, but we know that some area is swept through some volume. So we know what the change of volume is. So that's nice, all right? So delta V, and I should do that so we're not confusing with vo velocity. Delta V equals area times delta x for us, right? Um, 0 0.15 times 0 0.2, 0 0.03. <clears throat> if I get my math wrong, it's totally because I'm testing you and not because <laughs> I occasionally get my math wrong. So that's our delta V, all right? Our P is given, 500 kPa, and our delta V is given, 500 points 15. I also have a cheat sheet. 15 watts. No, 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 because what's also a unit, so that's not true. <laughs> 15, what is the unit? <laughs> kilojoules, happy with that? Good, cool. So we've, we've carried our, our kilo through, and a pascal times a meter cubed becomes a joule, because a pascal is a newton per square meter, and a, so it becomes a newton meter, which becomes a joule, which is excellent. All right. How much weight would we need? Okay, so that's, that's solution one, okay? But you already had a solution. You already had a, a method of, of solving this, right? How much weight do we need to maintain a pressure of 500 kPa over an area of 0.15 meters squared, all right? So this is force equals, man. Force equals pressure times area, all right? 
So we've got 500 kPa times 0 0.15. Feels like it should be 75. Is that right? Good. So we're talking about a cylinder, what's 0.15 meters squared? We're talking about a cylinder like Yay. We've put seven and a half kilos on it and we've compressed it up to um, five times atmospheric. What we'll actually find is that the amount of weight if we put a, a mass, like a lump of mass on there, we'd find we need less than that because the atmosphere itself is also giving us some pressure. We'll talk about that soon. All right, and what was our distance? We said our distance was 0 0.2 meters. So if we said work equals force times distance, okay, then we'd say 75 newtons times 0 0.2 meters, and we'd find that that should have been a kilonewtons. That looks better. So put seven and a half ton, that feels better. That does feel better. Good, good. So put seven and a half ton on top of the cylinder to compress it to five atmospheres. Okay, and so we've lifted that then force. We've had motion against an opposing force um, and we find that we have the same amount of work done, right? So this is just showing that you can use pressure and volume, which is what we've just learnt, or we could have used, that sounded expensive, we could have used <laughs> force times distance, um, which you already know. Okay, so you had a, you had a way of solving this problem. Um, cool. Questions from that? Excellent. What using pressure times volume lets us do is solve this question then at the top left hand side, sorry, I can read that because I'm quite close to it. At the top. So what if we had some arbitrary irregular shape? Okay. The volume of an irregularly shaped balloon increases by volume. It's an isobaric process at some internal pressure. How much work's done by the system? Well, in this case, you don't need to know what the shape is. And it's not necessarily lifting a weight in that sense. You can't necessarily think of it in that sense. But you can do work from state 1 to state 2 equals pressure times the difference in volume. We're given the pressure. We're given the volume. They're the same numbers as before because I'm lazy. No, but I just wanted to explain that the, the concept is the same and not go through a different set of math. Cool. And... The last one, which is different, so a cylinder with a cross section given, so we're using the same cylinder. Now we need the initial volume, um, so I've had to define the cylinder a little bit more. So one meter tall, it's compressed by some distance, so it's compressed from one meter to 0.8 meters in an isentropic manner, so K equals 1.4, so this is our, so we're talking about a polytropic process where K is 1.4, the initial internal pressure is 500 kilopascals, how much work is done by the system? See? Good. Okay, so now we're saying PV, PV to the K is some constant. We've got a pressure one, we need our volume one. Volume one equals height times cross-sectional area, 1.5 meters squared. Cool, so we've got our initial volume. We can get our volume 2 while we're at it, 0 0.8 times 0 0.15. Yeah, so we've got a... got a cylinder and we're compressing it, yeah? 0 0.8. 1. Cool. Volume 2. 
Any takers on that? Have I got it written down? Zero point one two. Zero point That sounds like eighty percent of zero point one three and one five. Yep. Agreed. V volume two. P one equals five hundred KPA. All right. That looks like the things we need. Work from one to two equals, let's check there. PowerPoint slides, it's isentropic. So we're gonna use the equation from the bottom right hand, bottom left hand corner. P2 V2, P1 V1, one minus K. Oops. E equals P two V two. Okay, looks like we need P two. All right. So to get P two, we're going to use this equation at the top right hand side. So P one V one. Oops. What's P2 equal when you get there? I'll clean up my letters. <coughs> That's not what I got. Hang on. One, two, one. Is it? No, good. Excellent, good. Do we need to know the derivations for the... Do you need to know the derivations for the formulas? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. It used to be a big part of the subject. I... I'm, <laughs> I want to move this subject away from calculations and mathematics, although it's definitely founded on that, and I want to move it towards understanding application. So I've got to drop something. And so what I'm going to do is provide formula sheets. I'll provide the formula sheets a few weeks before the class test. <clears throat> I haven't written it yet. Um, but I will write it and I'll give it to you. And you'll know these are the formulas I don't have to remember. And if there's something important you saw that you don't see in the formula sheet, you maybe need to remember that. I'll try not to be like that, though. Um, I think you should be aware that all this stuff just comes out of maths you already know, but I don't think you should be able to reproduce that under exam conditions. Yep. Good question. Did anyone do that calculation? Good. 83.4. I'll pay that. Kilopascals. So now we've got, what do we got? We've got P2, V2, P1, V1. We've got K. Excellent. So, work. I'm using subscript 1, 2 here. So this is work from state 1 to state 2. When we've got processes that, when we've got cycles that have many state changes, it becomes important to say, what are you talking about? We're talking about the work that's done between state 1 and state 2. Uh, equals, so what are you? 683.4 times... Minus 500 times. Okay, excellent. This is a 
do yourself at home, but I got 17 and a half kilojoules of work done. Um, it come and, and tap, by all means, tap, tap the calculator, um, check yourself. It's a negative. It's not a smudge. It's a negative out the front, right? So that says that when we compress something, uh, when we compress a cylinder, it's the surroundings doing work on our system, so it's negative work, okay? So, and that comes out of using the formula correctly. You just want to validate that and check um, and see what's going on. The other thing we can calculate is we can calculate T2, which we won't do, but we can calculate T2 and show that in fact the temperature must have risen. Okay, so that would come from our combined gas law that says P1 V1 on T1 equals P2 V2 on T2. I didn't give you a T1, but you just say ambient conditions, 20 degrees C, All right? Uh, this ratio only works if these temperatures are in Kelvin. Okay, but you can satisfy for yourself that when you compress an ideal gas ideally, the temperature rises. And that's not necessarily something that's intuitive. Uh, I had someone ask me a question at uh, UNSW Uni Day, and they said, what do you teach? I said, thermodynamics. They said, oh, how does an air conditioner work? And I said, well, you know when you compress a gas and it heats up? I'm like, no. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's because you're in year 12. And I haven't learned thermodynamics yet. Um, what about, yes, yes, you're right. I should have said, you know, like when you're pumping up your tire on your bike and the, and the tire gets hot? <laughs> I love it. Kids these days don't ride bikes. Yes, all right, good, good. Moving boundary work. So we've, we've done that. So if your fluid is providing is moving against some external force in the surroundings or the surroundings are working on your fluid you've got moving boundary work there's a couple of other types of work that I wanted to talk about as well because we've got a turbine denoted here in the bottom left hand corner as turbine that's how you can tell it's a turbine it's got some power coming out of it. this is a steam turbine probably let's call it a steam turbine this is part of a ranking cycle this is what's generating most of the electricity that we use in the room. And the casing on the turbine is, um, doesn't move. Turbines don't grow and shrink, well, they like, thermally grow and shrink, but it, not very, very much. And when they're at standard operating conditions, or steady operating conditions, they certainly don't. So what's expanding? What's, what force is moving against? Uh, what, yeah, what are we forcing against an opposing, uh, uh, opposing force? And this is what the inside of a turbine diagrammatically looks like on the bottom right hand corner. On the, typically on the outside, you've got what's called a stator. So just like in an electric motor, things that stay still. And you've got in this case nozzles. So the flow is going from the left hand side to the right hand side on this diagram. Okay. And so they are forcing the steam that's coming in to go up the page. Okay, so they're forcing the steam around. And so a turbine actually is trying to rip itself out of the floor with torque. You've got to bolt them down really securely, right? Because all the steam is forcing the turbine to twist one way. And then the rotor, which is these, so you've got blades on the rotor, and they're connected to the inside. So the rotor, the hub, is turning. Okay? And they are using little cups to catch that and try and force it back down the page. So, and the change in that momentum, you're gonna do this in 2600 as well with the Pelton wheel, same sort of thing. So the change in that momentum is forcing the inner hub to rotate. And as it's doing this, the gas is expanding. So as it, as it undertakes this work, uh, it is expanding. So it's, it's moving boundary work, but it's internally, well it's not moving boundary, but it's internally moving work. We'll say that the shaft work, we call it shaft work, and shaft work equals, so the overall work is 2 pi times the number of revolutions that you undertake times by the torque that you get out of that. And you probably do something similar in 1300. You talk about shaft work. You can differentiate that with respect to time and talk about power being 2 pi n dot, 
or if you put n in uh, radians per second, it's just the radians per second times by the torque. That's the power you get out of a turbine. So this is what's happening inside. It is moving boundary, but it's just encapsulated. So we care about shaft work because one of the main outcomes of thermodynamics is shaft work. We want, um, want work out of a turbine. You could consider a crank to be a shaft, but we won't. We'll talk about the cylinder. This is a picture of a, a turbine. These things can be big. Um, you can buy them. You can look them up. You can study them for your assignment if you would like to. This is obviously the rotor, so you can see the blades on the inside. Have you guys done the torque it takes to tear a steel shaft yet? Or is that 2400? Good. Not so yet. Radio. When you're doing that, right, say this guy's like two meters tall, so say he's about a meter from his belt to his hand, oh, that's earlier in shot. Have, when you get to that calculation, throw yourself in a, a 350 megapascal yield steel shaft that's a meter in diameter and see what kind of torque you're talking about to tear this thing apart. Other work that we might talk about, uh, we talk about electrical work. If you're willing to accept it, you are forcing electrons um, past their ability to, uh, their, their tendency to stay still, right? The integral of voltage times current um, over time, right? So power equals VI. So the, the total work would be the integral of that over time. Uh, we were talk about spring work. So if you're compressing a spring, you're doing work on that spring to compress it. Elastic deformation is the same sort of thing. This is just a, um, like a solid steel bar or uh, elastic energy. Yeah, again, we, we don't want to go too much into these sorts of things because this is really solid mechanics. The beauty of engineering later on is you get to combine these sorts of things together and build complex systems. I want very simple mechanical systems so you can focus on the thermal part of the, of the cycle. But we need to be aware that that exists. Um, and of course, potential energy or kinetic energy. So these are places that our work could go that may or may not involve moving boundaries um, for us. That was work. It took longer than I expected, and that's fine. Um, does anyone want to talk? So heat was like three slides. It's transferred across the boundary. We're going to talk about it later. Work was like, hey, let's actually get into the... Um, get into what's going on. Does anyone want to ask any questions about work? We shall carry on. Excellent, good. Heat capacity. Heat capacity is how we relate internal energy to temperature. All right, I didn't bring them. Polystyrofoam cups with equal quantities of fluid. One's at zero degrees C, so liquid water at zero degrees C. One's at 40 degrees C. The equal quantities, if I mix them together with zero down this end, so if you think it's going to be zero, you point to this part of the board. If you think the resultant temperature will be 40 degrees, point to this side of the board, and then you know there's a thing in the middle, right? So it's a scale, you point to the scale. If you think the resulting temperature will be less than zero or greater than 40, maybe this is not the subject for you. What's, what's the temperature if we mix liquid water, point, vote, Vote with your finger. Good. Most people are pointing about here, and that's the right thing. So, right, trivially, it's 20 degrees C. Okay, so well done if you're pointing in the middle of the board, if you're drifting either side of that. Um, have a little think about it. Okay, question two is less trivial, but I wanted to establish a baseline, um, and I wanted to get you used to pointing, interacting. Question two. 250 gram lump of copper at 80 degrees C is placed in a styrofoam cup containing the water we just mixed right, at 20 degrees C. Adiabatic, no heat transfer to the surroundings. What's the temperature when thermal equilibrium is reached? Now this end represents 20 degrees C, okay? And the other end represents 80 degrees C. You've got two substances with the same mass, okay? The average between 20 and 80 is 50. Okay, so 50 is in the middle here. All right. Commit to, you don't have to point, 
But look, look on the board and commit in your own mind where you think the temperature will be. So what is the temperature when thermal equilibrium is, re is reached? And then a secondary question, because we care about it, um, how much heat is transferred? Actually, do you want to talk to your neighbour and what do you think? Do you think it's 50 but less? Do you think it's 50 but more? Right? Commit to your answer, talk to your neighbour. What are you basing your decision on? Have two minutes. Let's pull it back in. So, let's see. We'll do some. We'll do some chatting. We'll do a calculation, and we'll find it. I'm surprised by the answer. I, I find the answer to be surprising. So, specific heat then is the property of a substance that relates the change in internal energy U, which is what we've been talking about, to something where, you, where A we can easily measure, and B we can relate to, which is temperature. All right. So. On the street, people aren't talking about the internal energy in the air today. They're talking about the temperature. It's hot and cold. Um, so for solid or liquid, we get C. This is heat capacity. This is the actual symbol. It's not just arbitrary constant C. This is the actual symbol that's used for heat capacity. Um, and the heat capacity is the change in internal energy divided by the change in temperature. Or if you're trying to calculate change in internal energy, and you can measure the temperature of a body. If you've got a lump of copper, for example. You know, it's going from 80 degrees to 50 degrees. What was the change in internal energy? That's delta U, okay? Or you know you're putting, you've got a cubic meter of water and you're pumping a megajoule of energy into it. How much uh, did the water change in temperature? Well, delta T is delta U on C. You knew how much energy you put in, how much the temperature change. C is the uh, constant that relates those two, and it's called the specific heat capacity. It's a specific unit because if you double the amount of quantity of uh, substance, you need to double the amount of energy to have the same change in temperature. Or, and you mentioned it, Chris, uh, MCAT, okay? If you capitalize U, so take the extensive property U, then you find that delta U equals MC delta T. Remembered as MCAT, which is something medical in the US. It's a test. Um, MCAT, cool. Good, so we need some data. What is the specific um, heat capacity of the substances that we care about? All right. Copper is listed here. Okay, specific heat capacity, 0.385. And water is listed here, specific heat capacity, 4.2. Nominally, all right. We've also got density, nine, all right. Copper sinks in water. Thermal conductivity, we won't talk about much, but that's talking about how quickly this process might happen. Um, and it's worth noting that these are given at 300 K, okay? So as you heat substances up, they tend to become harder to heat. But if you're dealing in the realm of room temperature or you know, a few hundred degrees C positive, so between zero and maybe 200 degrees C, as long as your water hasn't boiled, um, these are reasonable kind of, uh, certainly for the things that don't like copper and aluminium, these are reasonable figures to use. If you're talking about taking copper to its melting point, this, the heat capacity isn't gonna hold anymore. Excellent. Good, we've talked about the fact it's 300K. So, let's answer the question now. Is anyone nervous about the answer? They think they might have committed too early. It's, it's better when you think about things as you do them. All right, that's our question. Let's do some math. So. It's actually, sorry, 
Call that delta u equals m cat. Right, so we want, because it's insulated, what we'll find, let's, let's write out our delta u equals q minus w. All right, how much heat is going across the system boundary? So how much heat's being added, or how much heat is being removed from the system? Anyone else? Zero. Good. The system's insulated. We're told it's a styrofoam insulated cup. So no heat is being added to the system or leaving the system. How much boundary work or electrical work, other types of work are we doing in this process? Zero. Excellent. So delta U equals zero. Now, there's two aspects of delta U. Okay, you've got you've got the change of U of the copper and you've got the change of U of the water equaling zero. Excellent. And we know that delta U equals M cat. So we say mass of copper times C of copper times delta T of copper, which is T2 copper minus T1 copper plus mass of H2O, C of H2O, T2 H2O, T, God bless you, H2O. Equals zero, and that's a plus, not a T. Excellent, so we've got an equation that we can solve. Because the masses were equivalent, you're welcome. I'm going to divide throughout by the mass. So I'm going to say, get rid of that and get rid of that, because they're the same. The specific heat capacity of copper was 0 0.385. Now T2 of the copper and T2 of the water will be the same. Okay, because we're allowing it to reach thermal equilibrium. So whatever temperature the copper is, the water will be also at the end of the process. So I'm just going to call that T2. T1 of the copper plus 4.18 T2 minus 20. So now I've got one unknown, which is T2. And we've got one equation to solve. Which is, what are you, 4.56. What are you, minus 80 plus... 80 times 0.3 is about 35. 80-ish. <laughs> Sorry, what's that number? Yeah, go. Good question. Good, the, que the question was, isn't it supposed to be in Kelvin? It doesn't have to be for this question it might be good practice to use Kelvin anyway. The reason it doesn't have to be for this question is, right here, T2, let's talk about, so this is T2, right? Let's use a different color. Let's use green. All right. If this was in Kelvin, we would add 273.15. If this was in Kelvin, we would add 273 Oops, 0.15. And when we subtract the two numbers, we would get the same delta T. So it's good discipline to always use Kelvin, and you don't have to only when you're using delta T. If you're dividing by a times by temperature, absolutely has to be t Kelvin. For this case, I shortcut it, and I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, it's not 80, but I, yes. Uh, 
Does this only apply when the addition of thermal energy is zero? Yes. So the line above that is that Q equals zero because there's no heat transfer and work equals zero because there's no work going on. But I could have equally said, so you know, you've got a lump of copper 80 degrees C. I could have equally said the process loses one kilojoule of heat while the process takes place. Now it's not in a styrofoam cup, now it's in a glass cup. And then we would have had some Q term, okay? That would have just gone into the equation and then we solve it as normal, yeah? Good. Um, can someone tell me what that number should be? That's fine. It's 0.385 times 80 plus 4.18 times negative 20. Oh, it should be a negative and a negative. That's what I did wrong. 25 minus about 100, so it should be maybe minus 125. All right. No worries. T2, the number in green is probably wrong. But that's okay. I didn't write it down. T2 equals... Minus three. Oh, there you go. That'll do. I did write it down. Minus one one three point There we are. The number's now correct. Did anyone get T two? Twenty one, it's not twenty one. Twenty five point Zero six degrees C. So, in a linear scale, if this is 50 degrees C, this is 20 degrees C, if the person next to you pointed at about this point of the board when you were discussing it together, they did well. I, did, I don't get this right. I have a bad intuition for thermal capacity. Water is very hard to heat. Okay? And when we're dealing with water and other substances, we can't just average the temperature. In fact, that's bad practice anyway. You need to consider the heat capacity, and that's the answer. Anyone surprised by that? I was surprised. Anyone get it right? Anyone get it? Did anyone's partner get it right and deserves a, a chocolate? Yes, my partner. Did you? Yeah, well done. Good, I'll believe that. All right, is that a hand? All right, cool. Let's do that. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> All right. Hang on. Let me, finish this, let me finish this concept, and then we'll get out of here. Ah, oh, OK. We're going to finish on this. I'm going to let you think about it. We're going to start on it tomorrow, because it's a complicated concept. Earlier, I brought up the idea of what if we wanted to heat up the room by 10 degrees C. We sealed it off so people can't leave early, and we heated the room by 10 degrees C. Can we treat gas like we just treated solids and liquids? Talked about heat capacity for solids, heat capacity of liquids. What about gases? Students add about 140 watt in the process. Gases don't have one specific heat. Gases have two different specific heats. So it's, a, it's complicated and I'm glad that we'll hit it twice. They have CP which is called the specific heat at constant pressure. And that is the change in enthalpy divided by the change in temperature. We'll talk about what enthalpy is. And they have the specific heat at constant volume, which is the change in internal energy divided by the change in temperature. So CV is what we might think of from the last example, change in internal energy, change in temperature. Okay. CP involves enthalpy. For a, a solid and a liquid, the enthalpy and the internal energy are very closely related. They're, they're basically the same thing. Okay? So the reason that solids and liquids only have one value is they're incompressible. 
and CP equals CV, so we just call it C. And so we find that a change in enthalpy is CP times a change in temperature. So if we want to calculate what's happening in the energy space, we can measure temperature and times it by these values. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And table A1 in your textbook lists the properties for air and other, other substances. So here's K, here's R, which we've talked about before. We introduce CP and CV as well. We'll wrap it up there. We're going to start here tomorrow afternoon. Thanks, guys.